Okay, so welcome back everyone. It's great to see you all today. Um, I just want to remind everyone again that all the sessions are being recorded and will be available on the SOF Heyman YouTube channel soon. And um, just an update, Anna and I are still on strike and spending many hours a week on the digital picket line and feel free to join us. It's open to non-Columbia affiliates too and we can always send you the link. And today, um, an active organizer in our union, we're all members of the union, but someone who's a bit more active than Anna and I is gonna join us um, at 2.45 to explain more about the strike. And she's a PhD candidate in the Department of History at Columbia University, uh, obviously at Columbia. And um, I'll introduce her, late, her later. So. so back to our event today, where we are really excited about this panel, Epistemologies of Repair. The structure is as it was last time. Each presenter will give a paper for 15 minutes. Each presentation will be followed by a question from our great panel moderator, Dr. Amange. And after all presentations, Dr. Amange will open up the floor for Q&A. So to introduce our discussant for today, um, who is a clinical and health psychologist by training, Dr. Rosaline Amange earned her doctorate in cognitive psychology at École Pratique des Hautes Études, Sorbonne. She was the 2018-2019 Du Bois Mandela Rodney postdoctoral fellow at the University of Michigan and will be a summer fellow at the School of Criticism and Theory at Cornell. Her publications have appeared in scholarly journals such as Social Science Information and Universas, Universitas Psicologica. Her current book project is entitled Slavery Reparations in the Americas, an argument for racial terminology. And it argues for creating a legal culture that integrates African descent as an operating term to challenge Western policymaking on reparatory justice. Her interdisciplinary scholarship explores the intersection of politics, race, ethnicity, gender, literature, philosophy, and psychology. She integrates critical perspectives on culturality, blackness, ADOS, and decoloniality into theoretical and empirical research in moral cognition, social psychology, and political psychology. So um, over to you, Rosalie. Thank you, Holly. Good morning and good afternoon for you all. Thank you, Hannah and Holly, for organizing this tiny global discussion on reparation and Kaizeng for operating with the Zoom webinar logistics. We express our thankfulness to the Society of Fellow and the Amen Center for the Humanities, the Department of Anthropology, the Institute for Social and Economic Research and Policy, and for all of you who are present today. We also recognize and acknowledge the Columbia Graduate Workers Union, and we are in solidarity with them because of this currently ongoing strike at Columbia University. Today's presentation brings at the forefront of the debate on the possibility and impossibility of reparation for slavery and colonialism views on the epistemology of repair. Today, panelists present different ways of knowing about justice, thinking about reparations, understanding justice, and designing repair. And most importantly, today's presentation speaks about the uncomfortable historical truth that is colonialism and racial slavery in present day America. Because where there is truth, there is light. Where there is light, there is healing. And this is a healing process where reparatory justice can find its most noble place. To quote Césaire on this discourse on colonialism, we are not men from whom it is a question of either or. For us, the problem is not to make a utopian or stable attempt to repeat the past, but to go beyond. It is not a dead society that we want to revive. No, this is a present colonial society that we wish to prolong. It is a new society that we must create, a society rich with all of the productive power of modern times, one with all the fraternity of olden days. So the common denominator of these three presentations bring new perspective of truth, belief, and knowledge on justice for reparations. These three papers offer new epistemological regard of reparation and repair from and within different geographical spaces and historical contexts. 
from the British Caribbean island, from Barbados and Jamaica, to the Dutch Caribbean islands. So after our panelists have spoken, we will have some time to uh, question uh, for the audience. So you should see, you should see a Q&A box on your screen where you can submit your question for me to read out loud. We may not to get to all of your questions, but we will try to do our best. To start, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Zaira Simon. She's presenting today, Reading Caribbean Visions of Repair. Zaira Simon is a PhD candidate in Earth and Environmental Sciences at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. Zaira received a master's degree in Latin American and Caribbean studies from New York University. Her work explores the material and discursive formations of reparatory claims in the Caribbean with a special focus on Barbados. Her previous work has explored the politics of authenticity with carnival performances in Trinidad. Zaira, the mic is hand to you. Thank you for your presence today. Thank you so much, Dr. Amarj, for that um, uh, amazing introduction. I first want to thank um, Anna and Howie for putting together this workshop, which I think is timely considering the increased visibility to the reparations question, but to other mobilizations for justice, such as Columbia's grad worker union strike. And for those who are viewing, I highly encourage you to support the hardship fund for graduate workers whose pay Columbia University is docking in response to the strike. The title of my presentation today Reading Caribbean Visions of Repair draws from my dissertation, which explores the material and discursive formation of, of reparative claims made by Barbadian activists and also the CARICOM Reparations Commission, known as the CRC, which is a collective of organizers and scholars representing the Caribbean community. Today, I explore how the regional struggle for repair and particularly the claims made by the CRC operate inside and outside of a black radical tradition. And here inside and outside refers to the conceptual distance and proximity to black emancipation. But I'm also imagining these classifications in spatial terms. In other words, is it possible to imagine these representations outside of a black radical tradition when plantation geographies like the Caribbean exist not at the margins, but at the center of coloniality? and the unmakings of it. Again, my interest is in how reparative demands oscillate between varying modalities. I would like to begin with a sound bite from an interview with Don Rojas, Grenadian veteran of the reparation struggle in both the Caribbean and the US. He says, I quote, they don't understand it as a debt. We have to teach them that there's a debt owed to them and the debt owed to them is from the powers that of slavery and colonizers. They owe us a debt. We have to tell them the time has come to pay the debt and that rallying call has to come not just from the government, but from people of the region, organized conscious civil society leading mobilization, end quote. Don Rojas argues that in the Caribbean, reparative justice requires public education, but more importantly, the leadership of a conscious civil society. But what does a conscious civil society look like within the reparation struggle? But I think to answer this requires brief attention to the formation of, of reparative claims today. Like many reparative collectives, the CRC emerged out of the Durban Conference Against Racism in South Africa in 2001. The conference provided the first international platform for Caribbean activists to present their proposals for reparations for slavery and colonialism to former colonial powers. Unfortunately, the call was largely ignored by the US and its allies, which inspired the regional movement today. However, provincializing Durban as an origin of the regional reparation struggle works against the circulation of what Deborah Thomas calls black memory, because it denies not only the diasporic networks that have shaped the reparations movement, but as well as local genealogies of repair. Reparations, which is not restricted to the organizing of the CRC, has also strong linkages to Pan-Africanist formations. Contemporary demands for reparations in the Caribbean can be traced back to the Abuja Conference in Nigeria in 1993, 
which provided a pan-African forum to discuss claims for reparations for transatlantic slavery and colonialism. In the Caribbean, the Commission of Pan-African Affairs in Barbados was the first to advocate for a regional institution that would be dedicated to reparations, which further indicates the intersections between pan-Africanism and the reparations question. Reading Raymond Williams, Ruth Wilson Gilmore maintains that the black radical tradition is a liminal practice that is defined by a conscious operationalizing. I quote, the selection and reselection of ancestors, end quote. Offering another frame to think about tradition, David Scott questions, I quote, what conceptual ideological labor does the idea of a black radical tradition produce in varying contexts of its contemporary use, end quote. Inspired by both of these readings, I argue that while, while the reparations campaign operates in this tradition, the movement is shaped by a particular time and space that requires strategies that might challenge how we read a Black radical tradition. In a recent discussion hosted by Tempo TV, Sir Hilary Beckles notes that the 10-point plan draws on James Foreman's Black Manifesto which in the 1970s demanded compensation from white churches and synagogues to aid social and economic development within black communities throughout the US. Foreman's visions for black liberation, which outline how reparations could be implemented, are stylistically mirrored in the 10 point plan. The 10 point plan, like the black manifesto, explains step by step how reparations can restore cultural, political and economic life for descendants of enslaved and colonized peoples. Again, this form of operationalizing, or what I refer to as discursive building, is a critical part of a Black radical tradition. The influence of the Black Manifesto in the CRC's discourse demonstrates how reparatory frameworks move across time and space, and in this case, between the post-colonial Caribbean and the Jim Crow US. The 10-point plan calls for symbolic justice, including formal apologies and capital to restore cultural and educational institutions and to revitalize Caribbean connections to diasporic homelands. The 10 point plan also requests capital to tackle chronic health conditions, as well as psychological traumas of slavery and colonialism that continue to impact the region. It further calls for the creation of a restorative development program that aids both indigenous communities and descendants of enslaved people throughout the region. For the CRC, compensation can provide a pathway to a future beyond the Maangamizi or the African Holocaust and colonialism and its military genocidal policy, which are terms used in one version of the 10 point plan. The CRC's framing of compensation and repair aligns with the Pan-Africanist ontology of justice and specifically with concepts like ma'at, the use of Keswahili terminology, such as the Maanganizi, which refers to the African Holocaust, is intentional because it acknowledges the continuity of enslavement and other forms of racial violence. The 10-point plan is also informed by revolutionary socialism, to use Aaron Kamigasha's term, expressed by Black radical thinkers such as Walter Rodney. The parallels are undeniable between Rodney's uneven development and the 10-point plan. The CRC sees reparatory development as a counter to colonial and neoliberal processes, which echoes Rodney's argument that development driven by a desire to transcend the conditions and logics of capitalist imperialism is not in opposition to sovereignty. However, the 10 point plan does not advocate for the abolition of capitalism, but rather for equity through reparations. After all, the aim is for reconciliation with former slaveholding societies and for integration within a, global, within a global landscape in which the Caribbean has been marginalized. The CRC might share Rodney's vision, but not necessarily the outcomes of a revolutionary socialist struggle. And yet the 10 point plan is grounded in early reparatory moments like Garveyism and Rastafarianism. Its proposal for repatriation and the return of cultural property is inspired by Marcus Garvey, who advocated for repatriation to Africa and for the repossession of African materials. The 10 point plan also calls for monetary compensation to support repatriation and for domestic and international debt cancellation. The CRC's call for the right to development is in direct conversation with the Rastafarian ontology of repair. 
For the Rastafari Reparations Repatriation Working Group of the, Ichiro, of the Ichirogwa Anin Council for the Advancement of Rastafari, which supports the CRC, debt cancellation for Africa aligns with the repatriation of African descendants. So although the 10-point plan does not specifically address debt cancellation for Africa, its analysis of how debt produces uneven development in CARICOM states today is not antagonistic to a Rastafarian analysis of debt bondage, but there are also distinctions that cannot be oversimplified between Rastafarian claims and the CRC's proposals. These include Rastafarian demands for the decriminalization of cannabis, which are not addressed in the 10-point plan. The CRC's 10-point plan provides a critical reading of repair defined by black radical transformations in thought. Yet the CRC's advocacy is largely pursued through diplomacy. Diplomacy is the means for attaining repair or as Beckles defines, I quote, reparations is a political process. It's a process where governments interact with governments. It's a process where civil society rise up and persuade their government to take a position. Your government takes a position and the conversation with another government. And in that process of dialogue, reparatory justice takes shape. It's not about marching down the streets and getting reparations. It doesn't work like that. It's an intergovernmental, interinstitutional, interfamily discourse that creates the context of reparatory justice. So in this case, institutional action and representation is privileged over grassroots organizing, which I argue conflicts with mobilizations like Black Lives Matter and other anti-racist struggles we see today. And in this moment of Black Lives Matter, where many are insisting on immediate resolutions to racial violence, is it possible to convince Caribbean publics that diplomacy is the avenue to justice? How might the institutionalization of repair and its reliance on diplomacy, which is essential to legitimizing claims for redress, to center more critical readings of justice. Repair can be enacted in ways that deny or contradict more governed, pra more governed practices of justice, such as apologies or lawsuits, the defacements of colonial vestiges, as well as the protests against carcerality and current organizing against gender violence in the region, captures how justice is claimed in the everyday. Jovan Lewis reminds us that in the context of Jamaica, disruptible practices such as lottery scamming are one way to, I quote, reconcile longer histories and broader circuits of inequality through contemporary gain, end quote. I agree with Lewis that we need to wrestle with the politics of respectability that define reparative thought. It's important to emphasize that I'm not identifying the CRC's process, which is multifaceted as a weakness Rather, I'm interested in how these proposals might challenge us to rethink how we imagine political transformation in the context of a Black radical tradition. We can look at the CRC's case for reparations as a moment in which regionality, as fractured as it is in the Caribbean, is being mobilized both through a developmental discourse of reparations and a genealogy of Black radical responses. The CRC's reliance on diplomacy might unsettle the socialist revolutionary visions of Rodney and others identified within a black radical tradition. But it also suggests that there are multiple paths to black emancipation that are not confined to one singular iteration of black radicalism. The CRC's proposals also suggest that revolutionary socialism is not always the engine or desire of, of reparative struggles. It might be one modality for getting to justice, but it's not the end. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I, I, I would like to say something about your presentation. There is you know, something about the question of black radical tradition. And, and what I understand, there is two way of reasoning, two, two modalities from the community's viewpoint to the national state viewpoint. And here my first question for you. If each citizen of a nation state forms democracy, what are the possible venues in the CRC proposal to think diplomacy of repair within a revolutionary socialism stance? Yeah, I think that's an important question. Um, and I just wanna emphasize first that, you know, I'm, I'm not interested 
and giving instructions uh, to the CRC, nor do I think it is my responsibility to kind of enlighten organizers, right, who are grounded in a revolutionary socialism. Um, but I do think that there are perhaps opportunities for more conversations, perhaps more outreach to engaging, you know, I mean, like, ev like everyday thought around, around justice. And so that could take, that can take many different, many different forms. It could mean, you know, um, engaging Calypsonians. I mean, extempo for, is an expression of a socialist revolutionary uh, tradition. Um, it, it could mean, you know, engaging events like carnival um, or, or those who might not necessarily think that repair um, is the end, right? Um, or the only, um, or, 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 or the only pathway uh, to, to black liberation. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's my response. Thank you so much. Um, I understand that there is a process within it and engaging the communities in different layers, different ways to, uh, to make uh, the, the question of repertory just broad and more real, uh, adaptable to what it is and what is what's happening in the, the social world, in a manner to say. Um, thank you so much. Um, now we will um, switch to our second speaker, um, Nicole Himmler. She will present today uh, what it means to be repaired when claiming reparations for colonial wrongs. So Nicole Himmler is an associate professor of history and cultural studies at the Department Citizenship and the Humanization of the Public Sector at the University of Humanistic Studies, Utrecht in the Netherlands. Having studied as a Holocaust researcher, her current work focuses the legacy of colonialism, connecting oral history, memory studies, and transnational justice perspective. She will present a project, Narrative and Justice, studying the social implication of colonial recognition and reparation claims in the Netherlands. A new team project, The Dialogics of Justice, explore those reparation claims in the context of other reparation claims, all made through the civil court in the Netherlands, dealing with the faith, peace missions, sexual abuse, and ecocide. Nicole, the mic is hand to you. Thank you for coming today. Yeah, thank you very much for this very nice introduction and also for Howie and Anna having me here on this conference where we have such a focused um, talk on reparations. So I'm better or not to be here. Um, to start with, um, yes, I'm not a scholar on the Caribbean, so I will introduce you to, to the Netherlands and the way the slavery past is discussed in, in the Dutch uh, context. And so I'm coming more from a background as a Holocaust uh, historian who has always looked at reparation processes, not getting them into the beings, but uh, looking at evaluation. So what have they, did the promise they made, how were the effect of reparation instruments? And um, so there is a lot of research getting these recognition instruments in place. And I'm more interested in the effects of such instruments because we often see unintended consequences. So sometimes also undermining what claimants seek to reach in the first place. So I'm very interested in this process of what kind of claims are made and what are the results do they look like and uh, do they match the uh, earlier expectations. However, today I present to you an ongoing battle for recognition for the slavery past in the Netherlands, a battle that has not yet developed into concrete reparation instruments. Uh, we are following and interviewing different memory and reparation activists. My aim was to get a better idea of what is meant by reparation when reparations are claimed and how do those ideas relate to what we see articulated presently in the broader public debate. So the Dutch have a legacy of colonialism and slavery in the East and the West. So my starting point uh, was the East. So what we see in the Dutch Indonesian case 
We have since 10 years, we have civil court cases addressing mass violence in the decolonization war. And we have seen individual reparations and most recently even an apology of King Willem Alexander on a visit in Indonesia. The debate about how to address the legacy of slavery in the East as in the West is at a different stage. The current debate on governmental and social level is focused on the question, does the government need to apologize? And what would this entail? So the term reparation is less audible and less in the picture. So I will share with you some shifts I see in the slavery debate in the last 10 years. And then also how the idea of activists about reparations has changed over time and the role of the CARICOM therein. And finally, I will make use of Lisa Laplante's model of continuum justice, in which she distinguishes a minimalist and a maximalist justice approach. I aim to reveal in which way the state actors and the reparation activists have different understandings of recognition and reparations. So we can observe in the last 20 years how the slavery past became a present and there have been several turning points. So one turning point is of course the conference against racism in Durban where our minister Boxel he said deep remorse for the slave trade and slavery as a core business of the West India Company. And at the same year he inaugurated a, na um, uh, a national uh, monument which since then has an annual national commemoration. And we have also seen a National Institute for the Slavery Past and Legacy. I mean, this is of course very small compared to what happened in other countries, but it was a start, so at least. And what you could see that this annual commemoration, which started off as a kind of community event in the 1990s, meanwhile, our life broadcasted every, week, uh, every year on national television. And this started with 2013, with the 150 years of abolition, um, uh, the commemoration of the abolition. And there was also the new king, Willem Alexander was there. But was it interesting at that time, it was only symbolic. So he was there, but nothing happened uh, beyond the protocol. However, seven years later, the ceremony debate in the commemoration was immediately followed up by a debate in the parliament on racism and the question whether the government should um, offer an excuse, but also establishing a commission for initiating a broader dialogue in society. So while our premier uh, still rejects apologies, there is a research going on now on different institutional levels to what extent this would be an appropriate approach and what it does it entail. And what is interesting here, so I'm studying this dialogue process that's going on at the very moment on different social levels uh, in the Netherlands. And what we see on a government level is uh, they have a huge fear of polarization and fragmentation. So there is the idea if they would uh, uh, make an apology that they, um, yeah, that they don't speak in the name of society so that it's not uh, that society is not standing behind those uh, decisions and therefore they do a lot of research at the very moment, how does society look at this issue. So there are many uh, dialogue initiatives and they're also called dialogue initiatives. We will come to this in a moment. And there are several surveys to explore this issue. And it has been also a topic in the recent election programs of various parties. And one uh, instrument, for example, they suggest is 1st July, uh, to make it our uh, becoming a holiday so that it's an uh, official holiday in the Netherlands. Um, so um, to give you a, a, a small impression, so a survey from last month and had the headline, uh, the Dutch find slavery history serious but don't think apology is appropriate. So we have about a 60% believe that their country played a serious role in the history of slavery but only one third support an apology or feel the need for more historical research. Interestingly, in favor of an apology are those with a Surinamese and Italian Dutch background, but also people with a Turkish American Dutch population. So you see here migrant solidarity showing that there is also a citizenship issue at stake. And uh, regarding reparation, 
we see that from the one third supporting an apology, only one fifth demand fin and support financial compensation, which is at the end only 5% of the whole population would really um, yeah, support this kind of uh, um, transitional justice instrument. But what this kind of surveys show for most is the absence of a broader notion of reparations. So we always hear the same thing. It's about apology. It's about financial compensation without saying actually what it's really about and also historical research. There's hardly any other options in uh, what is um, part uh, of those questionnaires. And here we see how narrow the transitional justice debate is in a way in the public sphere. And I was interested if you speak now with memory and rep, uh, reparation activists, how do they define, you know, what are actually the aims they are um, going towards too. And uh, so the reparation debate changed and there were a few things which influenced these changes. And you could see how the storytelling, you could say the narratives about the slavery history in public spaces changed. We, one could see that uh, while 10 years ago, it was very much about a governmental discourse, how the government relates to the Caribbean and others. Now it's very much on city levels. So how do Amsterdam and Rotterdam um, regard this matter? So a lot of cities do research and it's always started from activist groups, citizens who approach their cities to engage more with um, this legacy. We also see a shift from economical numbers. So from an economic history, it has become a family history. So we have a lot of features, a lot of radio, television, where people tell their family stories. And what you get then there, it's not just becoming personal, but it's also getting entangled histories because you, many are have the enslaved and the enslavers in their families. So it's also telling plantage histories together. And this results in a call also to show more the multi-voicedness of history and the complexity of the colonial legacy, which is far beyond the black and white frames, which are pretty dominant in public discourse. And often recognition politics is also articulated in this kind of white black frames. We call it then the guilt and blame frame. So the classical reaction is uh, in interviews, uh, people say, oh, I, I'm, I'm not guilty. So then you, of course, you don't get really into a debate. So, and you see a shift in the last years ra rather more in towards let's talk, dialogue, and also the concept of shared history has become more uh, dominant in the public debate. So what we see here is actually that it's not anymore talking about their history. So the history of the Caribbean, the Dutch Antillian, of the diaspora, but it's rather our history, so the Dutch history. And this makes a big shift in terms of, before we talked rather about cultural heritage, also cultural trauma were dominant tropes within those communities. And now we rather debate about colonial legacy in terms of social economic injustice, misrepresentation, and also institutional racism. So those shifts also influenced the rep reparation debate in the Surinamese and Antillians um, community. And what you could see around 2013, when we had the anniversary of the abolition, mainly the cultural trauma trope was used to highlight the structural harm to the communities, as Franz Jogur de Loup uh, has shown. While a few years later, the revolution narrative was foregrounded. And of course, you know, it's influenced by the Black Lives Matter movement but also um, uh, local struggle, the Black Pit uh, tradition. So we have a racially charged blackface character in our annual St. Nicholas tradition. This is now very much opposed by a lot of uh, groups and also um, it's a changing tradition. So we, I think we leave this tradition behind us in two years. And here we see there is a social uh, progress uh, or a social process in Dutch society where actually a, a different narratives and a different language is found to talk about the slavery past. And um, so in, instead of, so it's going more from, um, whereas there was more talking about projects 
and uh, individual reparations, material reparations 10 years ago, rather calculating numbers. It's now more about structural development. And whereas, and on also the call, yeah, to oppose the dialogue approach by the government by saying equality first. So only then actually you can have a real dialogue. We have also heard notions of self repair within communities. So making the claim that actually if you would fund uh, black communities uh, and so that they can flourish, that maybe reparation wouldn't be necessary at the end. So that there is a kind of, um, you know, um, this notion of self repair lives very much in, in, in black communities themselves. And what you see is that there is a, a shift towards from material repair rather to social repair. So it's going re-establishing, building new relationship between the different um, diaspora groups in the Netherlands and also this relationship between majority and minority. So when we look now at uh, the model of Lisa Laplante, she developed a model how to how reparations, you need to know what the, what the aims of justice should be, then uh, you can choose what kind of reparation she is. And I can't develop here on her model, but she had a kind of minimalist and a maximalist approach. And whereas the minimalist approach is rather looking backwards, so doing uh, like reparatory justice, so compensate a past which is harmed with a causal relationship, Rather, the maximalist approach is rather about civic justice, which is about participation and inclusion in society, but also socioeconomic justice, so to remedy historic socioeconomic inequalities and redistribution. And I think that we moved in the Netherlands from the small notion of justice towards the larger notion of justice, but only within the claims that are made but not what is really entered the public debate. So there's a kind of a mismatch between what is uh, discussed uh, in, in, in the open sphere and what we see uh, bottom up. And I think uh, what we can learn there from, reparation are less about a specific product, but more about a social process of relation building that is looked for. And I think that this notion of social repair challenges also our current imagination about what doing justice for historical wrongs is about. And I would like to argue here that it would also make reparations maybe more acceptable by larger parts of Dutch society if this would be better in the picture. Because currently it's still the narrow blame and guilt frame, which is pretty much facilitated by this apology instrument in the media. And that creates the problem of acceptance in the first place. So while talking about repair in terms of restructuring relationships on a civic and socioeconomic level might probably allow us to have a more reciprocal conversation about adequate and just measures. So this I would uh, like to share here and uh, debate with you whether this, yeah, how to, what could be the next step in this process. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole, for your presentation. Um, what we understand that you expand the way of thinking about justice in the question of transformative reparation. And, and what I understand also that there is a broader overview uh, interrogating the question of plural justice model with Laplan, uh, speaking about the question of relation building, socioeconomic justice, civic justice, that you know, mixed with um, the question of restorative approach. So I have a question on the dimension of self-repair, cultural trauma. Uh, and, and my question is, um, is there a place for transformative reparation without a collective process of political self-repair? Um, is there a place for that with the nation state? And how does transformative reparation can help in doing that? Is there a place for self-repair in the political realm to help? Because the community also is doing this thing, but how you think about and what will be you know, the design of it. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So what is the place of the transformative? So where where is it or where does it happen? I think um, what, um, what transitional justice studies have shown that when we talk about transformative um, reparation or transformative justice, that a participatory approach is very, it's, it's very necessary. 
So that actually transformative justice requires a radical rethinking of participation. And uh, this is the words of Greedy and Robbins, for example. And then my question would be, what would this mean in the Dutch case? Do you know what is a radical rethinking of participation? So I think uh, for this, for me, it makes sense to look at this uh, dialogue process on, on different levels. So on, on activists, but with the, uh, with the state level, but also uh, we talked already uh, beforehand about the family is also a space where a lot of, um, you know, exchange needs to be take place uh, and on community level. So actually, I think this transformation has to happen on very different places and locations. And, you know, getting this already more uh, out there, because I see a little bit of focus on the state. So the state has to do something, which is also makes you very dependent that the state acts. So what do you do if the state doesn't act? I think here, very critical recognition theory comes in who says, you know, a lot of recognition is also affirmative in a way that the structures stay the same. So how can you really have a recognition procedure that is transformative? And I think this is the challenge in the Netherlands as, as well. So get recognition, but also in a transformative way. And I think that these dialogue processes are crucial but which need maybe be restructured. So it's really about not about society, but also the institutional structures, how they can be changed. Thank you so much because it's adding the question of when we speak about recognition, there is a cognition issue in it. Like how um, the state and the institution also cognitively detangle or unravel the question of ideologies, biases um, that is also necessary because the community is also doing steps. So thank you so much um, for this um, contribution to this question. Um, now, uh, and finally, um, um, I'd like to introduce uh, Jovan Scott Lewis. Jovan Scott Lewis is presenting criminal repair in the Jamaican Lotus Crime. Jovan Scott Lewis is an assistant professor of geography and African-American studies at the University of California, Berkeley. He also served as a co-chair of the Economic Disparities Research Cluster at Berkeley's HAAS Institute for a Fair and Inclusive Society. Jovan received his PhD in Anthropology from the London School of Economics. Jovan's work is concerned with the concepts of the market, capital, poverty, race, and postcoloniality, uh, which Jovan examined through the, uh, the economics race experiences. And Jovan's current project considered the function of capital value reciprocity through the Jamaican lottery scheme, a money transfer strategy that targets white North Americans to think about relation of capital and blackness and the overlapping wakes of colonial independence and the structural adjustment. Jovan, the mic is handed to you. Thank you for coming this afternoon. Thank you so much and thank you again to the organizers and um, I just want to, you know, kind of reiterate the point that 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 uh, uh, Zyra and, and Rosaline um, and how we made earlier about supporting the students at Columbia. Um, and I think the, the topic of our of our our session is, you know, intrinsically relevant to to their fight. Um, so I want to quickly um, share with you you know, the, the discussion, the paper today, um, type of criminal repair. Um, and I want to discuss a formula for repair that emerges within the overlapping wakes of colonial independence and structural adjustment in Jamaica. Uh, each of these moments has delimited the scope and scale of opportunity for many poor urban and black Jamaicans. These circumstances and the mitigation produced a novel sense of repair and a framework for reparation. The sense comes from the experiences of three friends, uh, who I call Omar, Junior, and Duane, who formed a crew that participated in the Jamaican lottery scam. Uh, just quickly, the scammer's intricate scheme that uses internet uh, telephone technology and call center performance to defraud thousands of primarily elderly white Americans, um, largely out of their life savings. Um, but for our purposes, the practice demonstrates how scammers have refashioned themselves and their country and the broader global relations with should, within which they are set uh, which I'm going to advance as a form of repair. Uh, so these scammers, right, Junior, Omar, and Duane, understood that the world as it exists was not meant for them. Uh, you know, so they drew on novel logics of capital, criminality, and blackness as a formulary for post-colonial repair to make a world for themselves and on their terms. 
the process for making this world was simple. Uh, Omar Jr. and Duane, um, you know, wanted and needed money, money that was lasting, impactful, and meaningful. In other words, they wanted money so that they could make life in their city of Montego Bay. Um, they had lived much too long without it, and that life was one that they no longer wished to endure. Theirs was a life of sufferation, which I've defined as an inescapable condition of chronic poverty foundational to life's experience and its very quality. So that money could equate to life was not a remarkable fact for them. Money had always set life's tone. Uh, it was as if they intrinsically understood the intimate relationship between black life and economic value. But money's absence bred misery, frustration and vexation and brought on a sense of worthlessness or what in Jamaica is called whatlessness which is a charge that cuts deep into the anxieties and insecurities of masculinist ideals and expectations of financial caretaking and productivity. Materializing their ambitions through the scam is appropriate given Junior Omar and Duane's read of the world. To them, the world was bent. It was marked and marred by political and economic strictures that have plagued Jamaica's development and haunted through structural adjustment. And navigating requires uh, navigating the circumstance right, requires for them to look at the world of scans and to maneuver within it accordingly. Their lives are situated within a kind of post-colonial condition of blackness, but one that is framed by a post-structural adjustment ethic. The state, right, uh, itself caught within a reciprocal cycle of colonial indebtedness, was too compromised and incapable to offer much in the way of opportunity for them. And so thus they were caught between an ambivalence toward political sovereignty and the opaque functionality of capitalism. So within these circumstances, I began to have an appreciation for why they might turn to crime for their opportunity. But I still wanted to kind of fully understand the moral framework by which they could justify their participation. I was surprised when then, you know, being inspired by a current and popular song by a dancehall artist Vibes Cartel, they made the argument that their scam was a form of reparations. So the crew's reparative justification was convenient. That much I knew, but it still held an undeniable quality and power. It uh, needed to be taken seriously. Um, and I took it seriously because I was following Deborah Thomas's urging that we use reparations as a framework for thinking. And doing so allows us to refocus our notions of citizenship, sovereignty, and accountability. I also chose to take their claim seriously and valid because it was born out of a genuine circumstance of intergenerational and structural post-colonial poverty. So for the crew, the reparations they claimed from their victims had little to do with the normative reparative basis with which we are typically familiar. Rather than being situated within slavery, their claim was an explicit matter of contemporary poverty, right? The poverty they experienced in their day-to-day -day lives. And in this way, the crew departed from a prevailing basis of reparations demand that was taking place and continues to take place across you know, the largely formerly colonized world. The scammer claim then did much to disrupt the usual discourse of hindrances of these, uh, you know, that these demands face, namely recognizing deserving victims and critically identifying complicit and guilty parties. In taking this approach, scammers engage in various ways with what David Scott calls the rude boy or the Jamaican rude boy's refusal. Right? And he argues that this form of refusal recognizes the unattractiveness, if not expiration of the quote, old options of liberal progressive rationality from which predominant reparative frameworks are born. Scammer refusal, in line with this formulation, is paired with a form of self-fashioning produced by vernacular articulations that resist relying on or investing in emancipatory ethics. This move thereby frees the scammer from being bound by liberal, respectable, and representational politics. Moreover, the scammer embodying this rude boy refusal expands beyond the respectability underpinning of the reparative frameworks and proposals um, that are offered by many rep reparations leaders and programs. Those frameworks, you know, of course, demanding a collectivist mode of recognition that can and perhaps should be simultaneously understood as reflecting a, a kind of form of respectability, but respectability that is used to kind of buttress a notion of the scales of injury, of injury and recompense. An example is a CARICOM Reparations uh, Commission, and I, I hope we don't seem as if we're bashing the CRC today, uh, but nevertheless, right? So an example is a CARICOM Reparations Commission or the CRC uh, platform, a joint effort of the Caribbean political and economic group of nations to seek reparations from former colonizers. The CRC invested in a post-independent structure of development, advanced a program that seeks reparations for the various social ills and structural disinvestment that the Caribbean region has endured since slavery. These consequences are framed as a collective grievance with the collectivity of the claim demanding the, intergener the intergeneration 
and compliance of all the integration and compliance of all claimants. Because of the criminality, scammers are discursively and morally excluded from respectable integration. But they also willfully refuse an integration. Critically, there is a recognition that the CRC demands a little more than an inter iteration of the previous and failed promise of freedom. If emancipation had its limits and independence provided the rested sovereignty at best, then so too would any formal and sanctioned reparations fail to bring about repair. And so untethered to the teleology of liberation, the scammer can prioritize its preference and ambitions to shape a more honest and thus novel sense of repair, which is the capacity, at least for Junior Omar and Duane, to accumulate. Admittedly, accumulation as a reparative possibility cannot accommodate a neat or scalable articulation of reparations that will satisfy a collective claim. As organized on a collectivist basis, reparations require the ability to accommodate a multiplicity of parties and a diversity of members. The scam and demand for goals the complications of that accommodation by asserting the claim of injury as held by the black individual and by asserting that that claim is valid enough without concern for recognition. Because for them, repair is not to be given, but to be taken. The scam therefore qualifies as reparation simply because the scammer says so. Herein lies one of the most central challenges of any reparations program, the ability to argue for the validity of the claim. The scammer refuses to argue and refuses to concede to the requirement of validation. By sitting out and, of and outside of the normative demands of recognition, the scammer rationale radically enables the scam to be interpreted as a legitimate form of reparation. Again, repair and reparations on their own terms. But still trying to get at how this works, right? The scam's reparative formulary is, you know, functional and radical because it mobilizes a reparative logic that is capable of reformulating the sites and perpetrators of post-colonial transgression in a manner that stretches and bends the conventional history of colonial exploitation. The reformulation is possible explicitly because of the spatial and racial negotiations of scammer recognition. When answering my question of how they could think that scamming North Americans could pay the reparative debts earned and thereby owed by centuries of British slavery and colonialism, one member of the crew replied in turn with a question, aren't they the same white people? So joining the reconfiguring of time as a reparative marker, this crew member had brought up something unexpected but unmistakable. Indeed, they were likely the same kind of white people if we overgeneralize the Anglo influence in the United States formation. Still, I initially thought that they must be different because of the colonial past. But by lumping together both the British and Americans, the crew member engaged in a semiotic maneuvering that accounted for a long history of Jamaican experience where the British and then the Americans function in the same capacity. In practical terms, um, and to say nothing of the high level geopolitics historically at play, if the British once had Jamaicans work the plantations, the Americans now have them working in hotels and call centers all of which trap them in the same cycles of poverty. This is a logic then of white fungibility that shifts the burden of proving the deserving of reparations away from black subjects. Instead, it places that burden on whites to disprove their legacy of inducing harm. This move opened up the scope of culpability. It upended the troubling calculation that reinscribes colonial property logics back onto black subjects in each geographic context as represented by the arguments of who owes whom. Again, through refusal, the crew radically redefined the normative geographic delimitations of reparative blame. The process uncovered and made bare and, and apprehensible the true interconnected crime of Western development. In other words, there was not just one guilty party. It was every party that participated and then benefited in any way from their current poverty and the system that produced it. The rationale is a demonstration of what Obika Gray calls a disjuncture between the misery of, and hardship of Jamaican's lived experience and the imagined experience of participating in the well being of America. The scammers produce an accounting that skips across time and geography to transform Britain's transgression into the United States. This is a genealogy that can be traced through the well documented post colonial custodianship of Jamaican exploitation, which has changed hands over the decades. As a result, scammers explode the geographic remit of injury and responsibility to offer novel and capacious terms of transgression. The mobility of transgression is made possible by their sophisticated capacity to trace colonial debt through whiteness across time and space. The reparative debt, specifically its mobility, is made apprehensible because of its core racial capitalist foundation in whiteness. This whiteness, the kind that is the same between British colonials and middle class North Americans, serves as a mode or function of inequality and thus offers a steady marker of blame across its permutations and exchanges. 
This move remedies the full depth of colonial injury by recognizing the fungibility of whiteness and using that fungibility, rearticulates whiteness as a modality capable of carrying blame and holding it insights that facilitate the most accessible claim making for repair. Fungible repair configures the basis, reconfigures the basis for repayment on the terms most suitable for the scammer satisfaction. Other more conventional programs for reparation are hampered both materially, but more importantly, discursively by fixed ideas of blame, which are rooted in a morality that is primarily the making of the colonial powers to whom they owe their injury. But with a deft shifting of blame through relocation, scammers manipulate the charge. Their practice therefore eschews the need to be made right by the assertion and the acceptance of colonial wrongdoing. So to conclude, set against a broader movement for reparations, which has seen growing political recognition, the scammer framework would very unlikely qualify as legitimate. My point has been neither to legitimize the scammer rationale nor to endorse the criminal modality by which it is executed. The power and value of the scammer claim, however, and however convenient, is that among the various reparations frameworks, it is the specific and personal ideas that make up the experience of living in injuries wake that matters. And this is what the scammers teach us. Moreover, emancipated from both from the expectations of both respectability and collectivity, the scammer reconfigures the sense of repair as a direct and undiluted satisfaction of those who carry any reparative claim. Thank you. Thank you, Jovan, for this presentation. Um, uh, very interesting about the question of criminal reparation and, and what we means about reparation overall and, and what is the more of it. Um, in which extent we can, you know, extend uh, our thought about reparation in today's um, America contemporary frame. Um, yeah, your presentation shows really a counter-normative way of uh, what repairs look like uh, in the Jamaican scammer view compared to the more collective uh, program held by the CARICOM. So my question is, um, how can the discursive articulation of reparative refusal be made legitimate in shaping the overall discourse of repair within the CARICOM programs, collective logic. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, you know, so the, you know, there's a question of blackness and what counts and what qualifies blackness at the heart of your question, right? And, and, and it's, it's a thing that we have to kind of hold in tension if we're going to try and make sense of what the scammers are doing. So what the scammers are doing is they're not only they're not only kind of refusing normative terms of respectability, um, but by refusing you know broader ideals of collectivity, they are also actually troubling the kind of stability of what we understand to be you know the collective notion of blackness. Um, and so they do that because they're emphasizing right or at least operating on the basis that on a basis that prioritizes and, and privileges individuality. And that's something that is effectively antithetical, right, to what we see as being some of the prevailing kind of frameworks or platforms for reparations. Um, it takes this collective, those platforms at least take a kind of the collective notion of, of, of the community, of injury, right, that falls back on a kind of Du Boisian notion that blackness is understood or defined by the kind of shared and collective notion of suffering. Um, and the scammers are saying, well, you know, Yes, that there might have been a system, right? There might be this kind of uh, notional sense of black collectivity. However, as an individual, I can feel and I can experience that injury, right? And so therefore, as an individual, I have a right to kind of articulate what the satisfaction of that injury should look like. In other words, how do you reconcile the mobility between collective and individual senses of blackness? Um, and that's what I think a lot of the kind of reparations programs are missing. There is, in other words, uh, a kind of lowest or most convenient uh, common denominator at play when we're thinking about reparations programs, right? Um, and so the scammers are asking us to kind of, you know, open our scope. And for programs that refuse to open their scope, the scammer is saying, well, you know, I simply will sit out and find my own terms. And so this is, you know, in some ways, you know, related to this question of self-repair, but it, it also isn't, right? This is, this is an act of reparation that is almost entirely based upon, you know, the kind of individualistic and, and, and agential terms of the scammer. 
Um, you know, so, you know, so that's what refusal is, right? It is this radical formulary, not just of or against a system, but absolutely, you know, of, of the self in a way to say, well, what is it going to take for me to become whole? And in practical terms, you know, and I didn't, I didn't talk about it, you know, uh, it, there's, there's not a lot, a lot of time really, but, you know, what repair looked like for these scammers, you know, was material, right? They were able to, you know, buy houses, buy cars, buy land, invest in their children's education, you know, do all of the things that when you actually look at so many of the reparations programs, they are what they want to accomplish, right? If you look at the 10 point plan, if you look at the very, you look at HR 40, look at all of these reparative programs and platforms across the world, really, you know, what they all seek to do is to secure education, secure housing, right? Secure kind of upward and onward mobility for black subjects as a response to, you know, centuries of disenfranchisement and inequality. So what those scammers demonstrated is that on their own terms, they can actually get at the same, they can get, get at the same outcome, right? Uh, what was most reparative uh, was for the scammer, at least, you know, this outcome absolutely reshaped their relationship to Jamaica, right? So, so what, we're, what we're seeing is scales of repair in the scammer, right? Scales of repair that qualify or are qualified at the level of the individual, that then are, are qualified at the level of the kind of family unit within kinship, again, sending their kids to school, these kinds of things. And then at the level of the nation state, right? Um, now it should be clear that the scammers are not invested in a kind of, you know, political, romanticized political kind of liberatory, uh, you know, project. But what happened was that they were able to say, "Oh, Jamaica is now a place that I can live. Jamaica is now a place that I can invest in. Jamaica is a place that I can be happy." I don't have to, you know, travel to Miami or to Toronto or New York or to London or wherever for opportunity. Opportunity is in my country. And so that to me was, you know, I think perhaps the best evidence of what, what rep repair should feel like and what reparation should accomplish. Now, what does it mean, right, that the scammers get there? They get there um, through an act of refusal. They get there by, you know, turning away from the system, as it were. Um, well, what that tells us is that they have a very keen sense that whatever the system is going to provide and call it reparations is not actually going to get them very far, right? Because none of the previous political agendas that have offered something like emancipation, offered something like independence, have brought about any meaningful improvement for them and their lives. Um, and so what that means is by necessity, there is a need to engage in this act of refusal. Thank you for articulating these ideas um, because you offer something about thinking about the practical need um, because what we see they are moving in a space of poverty and the question of thinking about reparation when your needs are not met uh, it is less a priority of thinking about how we can you know, move forward in a more uh, general state and, and take time to think about it and, and what i hear about um, they, they are also repairing the psychological physical needs first in order to move forward with the question of what it means about reparation so self-reparation is also connected to the question of, of the needs on, of the everyday life. Mm -hmm. and, and by, by doing so, they said, okay, we are not involved in the, the overall question of reparation. However, we have agency in how we can move forward for ourselves. So thank you so much for this insightful yeah, thank you. response because um, it's really gathering uh, the ideas of you know what we mean about reparation and repair and the process of it uh, in the communities and in um, in the, the political spaces. Thank you. So um, to resume the, the first part of this panel discussion and open to the Q&A um, to the audience and the panelists, I would like really to say that um, today, Zaha Simon, John Scott Lewis and Nicole Hilmer are really questioning justice from within. Uh, it is an inward process to, for me, reassess, rethink, and revisit a call for justice that is a long overdue. And, and today, panelists revisited the debate within a critical inflection from the local to the global, 
from the black traditional thoughts of repair to its contemporary understanding of the CRC discourse and commitment, from the transnational justice to a transformative justice on formal reparation, and from the question of criminal repair to a sense of social repair, a sense of repair from and within the community. Um, so to open this conversation, I would like to start with two general questions uh, for the panelists. Uh, when we speak, I know, the first one is, when we speak about truth, knowledge and belief on justice, reparation and repair, to which extent nations, communities and individuals are willing to engage in a process to, that is cognitively demanding of oneself to face biases of the past in order to achieve equality of the human race? That's my first question. And my second question is, how much more valuable is humanity than ideologies of the colonial past that are still alive in the institutional spaces and human relationship? And how we navigate with the question of liberation, the question of race and blackness and, and alias. I am extending the question of, of it and how we move toward the question of humanness and, and thinking about uh, Fanon and the question of um, radical revolution of love and, and liberation psychological liberation, economic liberation, um, in, in a way. Thank you. Does someone want to respond about this question? And also, please, from the audience, we are welcoming your questions. Uh, we will be more than happy to, to share the question to the panelists. So I'm looking at the question at the same time. So there is a question. I'm going to start with that and let you <laughs> think about uh, the process. So I have a question, and I think this is for Zaira. Can we not say as well that the reparatory demands are also in response to certain failures of Caribbean sovereignty and statehood. So this is the first question. There is another one, so I'm gonna, you know, let you start with this one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, so I, 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 I mean, I, I, I didn't talk about this, but um, you know, so I, I take the, for example, I mean, in for for. for for Rastafarians in the region, you know, um, there are many groups who are explicit about how they support, you know, the CRC's proposals, um, but that they too are seeking redress from CARICOM states. And of course, I mean, these, these arguments, I would argue are also um, place-based, right? So they vary. Um, but I mean, in regards to like the, the contradictions, right. And how the contradictions sort of play out in the context of the CRC, right. And CARICOM go governments, uh, as, as a whole, um, there, I mean, the contradictions are there and, and I think they show up, you know, in the language that gets used, um, the language that gets used, perhaps not necessarily so much in the 10 point plan, um, but in other discursive spaces like lectures and, and other public speaking events um, where, you know, and, and, I, and, and I think I engage it, you know, I engaged it uh, in, in the presentation, you know, um, the ideas about, um, that it takes it takes institutional cooperation um, over mobilizing in the streets, right? Um, and I, I mean, so there we see that, in a sense, you know, the conversation is so restricted around uh, these ideas about respectable leadership um, and 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 what and what is required. 
and that does decenter or or silence you know I, I think the the critique the critique the everyday critique about um carry um you know uh about uh and and other you know uh multilateral organizations so so for example i mean in the case of barbados it's like all right, there, there's a national conversation um, that has become even much more visible now with COVID around reparations and particularly facilitated by Barbados Prime Minister, Mia Motley. But the question is, is that, you know, okay, how could we be talking about reparations when we're so invested in these kinds of like tourism COVID recovery plans, right? I mean, that further disenfranchise uh, poor black people, um, you know? So, so the, the, the contradictions are, are present, they are there. Um, and I think, yeah, again, I, I just think it requires more, more critical conversations um, about, you know, who is, you know, who, who I mean, who, who, who is the CRC speaking to? And what, and what legitimizes that, that speech? Yeah, T thank you so much. The question of who is speaking to and, and what kind of speech speak to the, the necessity of the question of reparation and, and regaining sovereignty. And I, I'm, I'm gonna speak about also the question of sovereignty for the, the selves and, and how it make the whole of the repression process. Um, so I have a question. Thank you so much, Zaya. Um, for, um, thank you for waiting. This, um, I have a question from Nick, for Nicole. Uh, Nicole, uh, in your work with memory reparation activists in the Netherlands, to what extent does the precedent of preparation for the Holocaust come up? So this is the first one. And how supportive are contemporary institutions that deal with Holocaust history and memory like the Anne Frank House for Reparations? activism and the part of the Dutch activist of color. Your, your mic, you can turn it on. Thank you. Oh, good idea, yes. I just said I uh, understood the second question because the connection is so, so. Can you summarize the second question? The second question was, in how supportive are contemporary institutions that deal with the Holocaust history and memory like the Anne Frank House for Reparation Activism on the part of Dutch activists of color? How they are supportive, um, thinking about you know, the question of reparation and how yeah. these two you know, communities come into play with the issue. Yeah, yeah thank you for this question. Um... I think, of course, when studying the different communities in the Netherlands, so the Jewish case is always a reference frame. It's a kind of role model because uh, there, for example, for legal cases, the status of limitation was not, uh, so family members, for example, second and third generation had a, a right to compensation. So there is a reference frame which is used at the very 10 years ago, it was often used as the Black Holocaust was the narrative in order to create legitimacy for their own case. Whereas you could argue it loses a lot of aspects if you use it as a reference frame because the aims are different. So on the one hand, it helps to get attention to the case, but on the other hand, it also loses, you know, it's a much broader structural, yeah, struggle for, for justice on a socioeconomic level, on a civic political level. There are so many other issues. So I would rather argue 
it helps to get it on the gun. The, or the other high is it narrows the justice we are talking about. So in a way, the Holocaust mindset that I think is not always very supportive to, to, to discuss this case. On the other hand, you see a lot of solidarity from those institutions. And this is a new thing that it's really what Michael Rosberg called multidirectional memory. There's a kind of a lot of relationship building and supportive action. And I think also whereas scholars or literature likes to talk about competitive victimhood, it's a very everywhere. I think it's the other way around. I think it's state structures who create this competition between those, you know, these recognition instruments. It's not in the first place, you know, coming from groups. So there is a kind of, you know, hierarchies are not there, hierarchies are made. So in this way to answer, yeah, so the Holocaust is, uh, um, has some advantages, but uh, in kind of making um, the movement and as a reference model, but it has also some limitations. Yeah, and, and as you said, there is, you know, the group inside of the group, the question is different than, you know, the institution and how they make, you know, people to compete uh, on the question that is framed on the umbrella of human race. So that's very interesting that you bring that and how they support each other in the process. So yeah, it's still something that there is a need to think about the multiple way of, of supporting the question of reparative justice for the ADOs. Um, there is a, there's two questions for Jovan. Uh, I'm gonna ask you know, one first and after speak to Zaira for the second question. Uh, so uh, Jovan, do you know of a similar scheme in the other places which are framed through reparative discourse. Do you know of a similar schemes um, in other places um, framed around this question of the discourse of reparation? Yeah, um, so there is, you know, so there's something that I wanna kind of offer, which is, which is perhaps even more radical, right? Which is this this possibility for any claim making to, you know, to to be a reparative act of claim making. Um, again, working with the scammers model of the kind of ability or power or right even to you know have the individual be able to frame um, acts as reparative acts. Um, one might be able to argue that any kind of activity or, or, or action, once you can have a framework in place that's stable enough, I suppose, that identifies the kind of victim or the other party in the, in the scenario as owing repair could be marked and claimed as, as, as a reparative act. Now, what I will say is that the, in terms of scamming, you know, there have been some discourses around not necessarily reparations specifically, but when we look at the say four, the 419 scam, right, in Nigeria, even the Sakawa scams in Ghana, right, there's a post-coloniality, right, and an injury of post-coloniality that you see in the literature that gets at a kind of justification, uh, justifying model that allows for what we might see as a reparative claim. What I can say is that, you know, with oil pirates in Nigeria uh, who've targeted Shell and, and so forth, right? They have used directly the language of reparations, right? Understanding what these, these multinational corporations, you know, have done. And then if we follow the work of the plantation school folk, like, you know, if we're thinking about, you know, Norman Gravan specifically, who says that we need to think about multinational corporations as iterations of plantation, you know, economic actors, then it makes entire all of the sense in the world, right? Um, so, but what I want to try and advance is, is, and what I want us to think about very and take very seriously is, you know, what does it mean to kind of hold the injury, right? Uh, on yourself. I mean, and we, you know, going back to an earlier, my earlier answer, where we see again the kind of the slipperiness by which, you know, a black subject moves between the modalities of, of individual and 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 collective, right? Um, if the if the threat of blackness, right? If the right, all of the qualities of blackness that allow for the individual to carry the collectivity of blackness on their individual person at all times, 
we're thinking about stereotype, we're thinking about all manners of, of, of really practical forms of racism, surveillance and so forth that do this work, then the, the, by that logic, the inverse act right, of repair should work the same way. Right. So in other words, um, we may, you know, especially for those of us who um, uh, maybe live in these post-colonial spaces, right? I can remember children, you know, saying, or I can remember an incident where there was a child who had stolen something and had made the claim, well, it's a kind of reparation. So we're not really using the language, but they owe me. I'm old anyway. Right. And so you see, you see in some kind of really haphazard ad hoc ways there is this sense, right, this legacy, whether the plantation of injury that operates, you know, through simultaneity, you know, by which any act can, you know, be argued as an act of, of, of reparation. And I'm not trying to legitimize that because again, you know, you, you bring that to some policymakers as it's a non-starter. But again, we have to take that actually very seriously when we're thinking about, well, if we are gonna to put together how many trillions of dollars or whatnot, Whatever that does, it must accomplish the sense of a lived experience of repair. Because what we know is that the opposite direction is how the kind of lived experience of injury moves upward and outward into the broader scaffolding on the structure of, of, of living in society. Um, and so for that reason, that's a very long and convoluted answer, um, you know, perhaps, but for that reason, then yes, to the, you know, to, you know, to, you know, Howard, Howard's question, right, there is, you know, there is that ability in, in, in other acts of scamming. Um, and that's, I wanted to, I was going to connect it to your earlier question, Rosaline, right, but I, I won't for the moment, because I know there's a second question that that's following up. Um, the second question, um, uh, is, I'm gonna go in through you because uh, it's very interesting. Um, uh, was like how have schemes received on the side of those who are schemed? Mm -hmm. How they always white people? All right. Or can it be anyone? Right. What happens if the person schemed, for yeah. example, is African American? Because yeah. you know. <laughs> And that's a very, and I've been asked this question before, right? And I think, and I think, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a very legitimate question. And, you know, again, what the scammers are offering is a framework by which they've been able to reconcile, you know, they've been able to reconcile, you know, the, the white people who they've scammed as being a form of repair. And I think a couple of things are possible here, right? Well, they can count one kind of, you know, criminal gain as repair and the other kind of criminal gain as just criminal activity. That's entirely possible. One can scam all kinds of people and the, the money received from this variety of scams can in one scenario just be robbing somebody, right? And in the other, it's an act of reparation. And I think, you know, that has to be kind of thought of, you know, as, as, as logical, right? It is, you know, we, we, we are in all kinds of relationships all of the time where we do things, right? and say things that may be the same act or the same words to different people and they have different meanings. The one example is the word, I love you. We know what that means in all of its contextual cases, right? Same word, different affect, different meaning, different consequence, right? And so, you know, so I think for that reason, that allows for an openness, right? So the scam is the act. Repair is the framework. Repair is a framework of interpretation, of understanding of what that act is, right? And so I think in that way, that, that, that kind of obviates the need for us to kind of be overly precise because that's what the scam is trying to, you know, or I'm arguing the scam is resisting, right? This over codification, this over particularizing of what counts as repair, what counts as reparation, because when you do that, again, going back to my lowest common denominator of repair thing earlier, you leave people out, you leave people feeling unrepaired, which means that, again, going back to the, the operation by which individualism and collecti collectivity right, operates, if you don't right, repair everybody, nobody is repaired. Right. And we can go back to you know, very famous you know, slogans from you know, civil rights, 
you know, and none of us are free until all of us are free. These are the actual logics, right? Going to your earlier question, Rosalina, about cognition and, and so forth, right? These are the actual logics that are at play when you're thinking about blackness. So if none of us are free to all of us are free, then by virtue of that logic, none of us are repaired until all of us are repaired. And the question is, how do you get there, right? I think the scammers have, have something to offer in that way. May I add something? Yeah, I just wonder oh, if it's not also about the power of the narrative mm -hmm. because they frame the action, you know, and this mm -hmm. is also kind of self repair. I mean, it's the way you look at it, and that's the that's your agency, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, I came across it very much in my Holocaust research is that when people, when we talk about reparation policies, it's very putting people in a very uncomfortable position because it's not something you really like to. Um, you don't want to see uh, see yourself as claimant for justice because then you have to frame yourself as victim. So it's a very uncomfortable position. So what do they do? They have a narrative trick. They 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 show you a position where they had agency, mm -hmm. so where they determined the conditions of repair. And they said, you know, this was an encounter which was really reparative. I mean, they said they they told the story they didn't frame it like this but that was the frame so they said this encounter made a difference to my life and so i was really astonished after a lot of interviews that there is always this kind of memory which is um, yeah the power where the the strength the repair came through the narrative how they told the story and can you see this in your case as well yeah absolutely absolutely you know and it's and it's you know I mean, what does it mean to have repair without formal reparation, right? I mean, this is this is what's this is what's happening in the Jamaica case, and it's because of this ability to kind of narrate, right? You know, the the activity to narrate the outcome, right? Um, and so I think you know what happens is we get really fixated on the kind of policy aspect, or at least the narrative of the policy aspect of it. And we're not we're not really spending enough time thinking about the narrative on the other side of that equation, which is, you know, what are the narratives that 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 people who we identify as injured, right, of deserving of some kind of you know reparative compensation, um, recognition perhaps, right? What are they, you know, what are they thinking? And you know, going to that point of narrative, you know, we see this, you know, at the heart of the resistance by so many heads of state to actually, you know accept and acknowledge the, the kind of injury of slavery, right? And they used also all kinds of discursive temporal and geographic tri tricks by which, oh, well, it wasn't us. And oh, well, technically it was legal. And, you know, all kinds of nonsense that are effectively discursive tricks. And so, you know, this, the scammers are saying, listen, the world works in this really corrupt way, right? And, and, and I am not invested as a scammer, right? In, in trying to kind of, you know, correct it. What I will do, however, is, you know, thinking about the way that the world works, right, and thinking and recognizing that the way that the world works is what caused my injury, right, then the way that the world works should bring about my repair. Um, and that's, and that's what's happening. And so for that reason, narrative sleight of hand, logical kind of loopholes, all kinds of things are the ways by which they became injured and it is the way by which they will, you know, find their, you know, find their repair in the end. And I think that's, you know, that's, you know, that's a kind of honesty and radical honesty, actually, that I don't think we see, you know, too, too often, at least in, you know, in many of the kind of conventional platforms, platforms, which I might add, are also invested in their own narratives of uplift, you know, of progressiveness, um, without really asking, you know, <laughs> what does the poor person want you know what i mean what does the person living within these circumstances want and if you are starting a reparations model and you don't ask that fundamental question then effectively it's a fool's errand because you will throw money after people who will ultimately you know not feel satisfied but will be actually further disadvantaged because they will now be without the ability to make a claim of injury because of the technical satisfaction of that of that of that injury yeah, and to add, it's reproducing the same. Oh, <laughs> yeah. it, it just to add on it, it's reproducing the same cycle of, of you know the victim and, and the savior, uh, you know, complex and and the the, the question of hierarchy and, and the status quo of the issue. And as you said about the question of discursive formation, um, not thinking about the communities and what they know about it, 
how they think about it and what does it mean for them because you know where you are in the poverty spaces uh, the question is really at stakes in terms of life <laughs> it's everyday life i need to eat i need to breathe i need to to, to meet my needs um so so thank you for bringing this subject because uh, um, it's allowing us to move the conversation toward the people who are living these things daily, knowing that in the Caribbean islands, the British one, um, the, the, the Dutch one, uh, the French francophone one, uh, the question of illiteracy, education, um, the level of uh, socioeconomic is really low. Uh, so how can we you know, think about the issues coming from them and not only from states? Yeah. Yeah, I want to reply to that. I mean, because, you know, the thing is, and, and I, you know, I, 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 I didn't have the opportunity to sort of share it in my 15 minutes, but, you know, there's, a, there's an archive, you know, like there's, there's, there's actually an archive of these connections and disconnections. And where do you locate them? You know, it's sometimes, it's, sometimes it, it's, it's in these policy documents. It's, it's probably not in the 10 point plan, but like in my, in my doctoral work, I've, I've spent like two years looking at, for example, a reparations report that was written by the Barbados National Reparations Task Force in 2017. And I mean, it includes the kind of logics and sensibilities from the Islamic tradition, from the Anglican Church, from Rastafari, um, from from you know other African spiritual traditions, and it also includes a transcript of a, a town hall meeting where you know those debates were actually happening about like how people identify repair, and I mean yeah I, I mean it's like it's it's quite and, and this is why i i say it's really important to spend time looking at how people um how these collectives sort of frame right their debates and 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 the sort of languages that they that they use um because it's often right there the frictions the the symmetries i mean it's 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 documented um it may not show up, you know, um, at say CARICOM summit meetings, but you know, there, there is an archive, there is an archive of this. And at times it's not necessarily top down, it's bottom up, it's both. And, and that's why I'm saying the kind of like spend time, like looking at this slippage, this movement, this, you know, constantly of being inside and outside and thinking about the forces that motivate that, that motivate that movement. And I wanna say this too, if many find, you know, accepting lottery scamming as not like an appropriate form of repair, then my God, I mean, there, there are like popular representations that might even disturb people even more. And I'm thinking of, like I'm, I'm a major Lovecraft fan. And there's this episode where Ruby, you know, um, takes vengeance on the manager of a, of a mall. And, and she does this all with the stiletto. And it's a very hard scene to watch, but I thought in, in like looking at that, hmm, would we regard this as, as, as a form of justice making? Um, and how might, right, and, and how might that problematize, you know, uh, the respectable practices of, of, of healing that many people sort of ascribe to. Um, I think we have to, I think we have to wrestle with that, you know, um, because it is happening. Um, it, you know, it, it is, it is happening. And I think the question that I come back to, you know, reading both um, Dr. You know, Imler's and Dr. Lewis's work is where do we locate transformation in these processes? Where does the reckoning take place? Yes, yes, amazing. 
yeah, that, that's so, so meaningful. Where where the transformation shifts? Where we are? Where 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 how look? Where is how look in this question? And, and how we frame that? And how we let the people also express the real meaning of it? So I have a question. Thank you, Zeha, because um, you you bring the conversation forward with um, the acceptability of of reparation and repair and form of repair. Is it morally acceptable or not? Uh, just a question that I'm bringing there. Uh, we have a question from the audience uh, from Bedford. So if there is a form of repair and justice on an individual level for the scammers, how should the institutions respond with this uh, with, when this is found to be a crime? Yeah, I think, so there are a couple of answers, right? Um, <clears throat> one is, is slightly you know, more sensational, which is that we have to actually reckon with the notion of criminality and what it means um, and, and the kind of temporality of crime and criminality. Um, the injury of slavery, the injury, I mean, if we, I mean, my God, if we think about the, the ongoing set of arrangements that, um, the post-colonial world, you know, are required to meet, then how do we not see that as ongoing acts of criminality? You know, the in intentional restriction of local markets, right? The, I mean, sanctions, these are all, right, what we might consider criminal acts. Um, and we have to think about that. Um, we have to think about that in a very serious way for us to actually move the conversation forward because what we do want it seems when i say we right what we want is to be able to kind of have our cake and eat it too right so you know the question of the moment of transformation that moment of transformation comes with a moment of looking really hard at what it will cost right the the, the cost of being culpable the cost of being guilty right but also on the side of the of the so-called victims of the black subjects, the cost of maybe not being fully satisfied, right? Meaning what what is happening in that exchange? And that's why in my book, you know, I talk about, you know, that reciprocal negotiation where it, you know, freedom isn't free, right? And you know what I mean? And so we have to kind of sit with that for a moment. And we have to sit with that by beginning with this question of criminality, right? We have to not only recognize that slavery was criminal, I mean, right? in that moment and in this moment, but also all of the you know, current circuits of regulation that you know, former colonized states and peoples are, 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 are required to accommodate are also part of a circuit of criminality. Now to kind of speak specifically to this, right? If we, if we take out the, the, the act of the scam, right? What happened in the Jamaican lottery scam as a form of reparations? What we saw was effectively a model of wealth transfer, right? From one group to another. And then that receiving group took that money and they did something with it, which ultimately led to repair. Now, so if we take away, right? And I mean, I remember when I wrote the book, I was like, listen, I don't want this to be too much a book about scamming. Like, you know what I mean? I didn't want the book to be called scam or anything because I knew that would distract. Right. I knew that the sensation of criminality would distract. Even in writing the book, you know, I didn't, I didn't, I mean, perhaps, you know, to my detriment, I didn't situate scamming alongside the other historical and conventional acts of criminality in Jamaica, like drug dealing and gun smuggling, that kind of thing, because I wanted it to be seen as separate. Right. I wanted it to be seen as a mirror, not to those kinds of criminal activities, but to the general criminality that is kind of contemporary Western capitalism, because that's the way the scammers saw it. So moving away from the kind of sensational notion of the scam, you know, somebody's grandmother on the other line, you know, being robbed of, you know, one of the victims lost their railroad pension. I was like, my God, who still has railroad pensions? But apparently railroad pensions are still a thing. And this poor woman lost her husband's railroad pension. We move away from that for a moment. What we have is actually a model of cash or wealth transfer. And this is something that lots of people have advocated, right? People within the kind of reparations world have advocated. Um, also people thinking at kind of local levels. I'm in California, right? We have, we have the former mayor of Stockton, California who advocated and put into place a kind of universal basic income policy, right? A year plus later, right? What we're seeing 
right, is what people have done with that money, right? We have, for example, in, in, in the United States for the past year and a half, I've been a beneficiary of, 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 of this, which is the freeze on the student loan payment. What we're seeing is that with this access of, of cash, right, all kinds of things are starting to happen. People are opening businesses, people are saving, people are investing. Right. Also in California, there's another program, I can't remember where it was located, where um, the unhoused were given access to money. Right. They were just given money. And as a part of that, what we saw, what, what they saw, I wasn't a part of the study, but it was a reduction in, in drug use and all kinds of things. So I think, you know, to answer Beth's question, right, the way that institutions can respond to, to what I'm offering with this scam is by looking at what was able to be facilitated by the scam. The crime is actually that these, these guys had to get access to that money by way of engaging in criminal acts. One of these guys tried to work at the call center. You know how much he was paid? A dollar an hour. That was pre-tax. That was pre-spending money on his, on his living expenses. How is that not a crime? Right. Um, when Jeff Bezos, right, is the world's most billionaire Martian or whatever he is right now, right? Moon man. So, you know, the point is. How is that not criminal? Um, so what we have in the Jamaica lottery scam is effectively a, a, a kind of practice of wealth transfer as reparation. And it's something that is actually not that radical on, on the face of it. What is radical is the means by which right, that wealth transfer uh, was pursued and demanded. And that to me is, is something that is also worthy of, of some further attention. Jeff Bezos. Thank you. We, are, <laughs> we are close to, to him, but, um there was a question to Zayn uh, that um, was the next. Uh, where do Caribbean political elites fit within the contradiction as being themselves for various and stern supporters of neoliberalism? If you can give us. Um, I kind of thought I answered that question um, a little earlier, you know, we're talking about like Barbados, what's what's happening. Um, and so I'll, 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 I'll repeat that, you know. Um, so here's the here's the issue, right? The, the thing is, is that you have leaders, right? Uh, like Barbados Prime Minister, uh, Mia Motley, right? who has, you know, listen, her trajectory in the reparation struggle goes way back, you know? Um, this is prior to the Durban conference. Um, and, I I, and, I, and I think it has a lot to do with her, her upbringing. You're talking about, you know, many who are of the black power, you know, generation. Um, and as, I think it has sort of taken her a while as prime minister to be able to be much more vocal um, about the reparations agenda. And, and even, I mean, what she came up with as the Caribbean Marshall Plan, which was circulating last, last year, right? Um, so there's been all this momentum and she has in many ways been, been a part of that. Yet at the same time, if we look at you know, the reckoning of the pandemic on you know, island countries like Barbados and the response to that reckoning, which has sort of taken the form as you know, the welcome stamp program that has allowed tourists right, from the global north free access, okay, um, to Rome, you know, <laughs> poor people's spaces, and, and, we, and we really saw this during the Christmas season, um, which led to a surge of, of, of new COVID cases and stuff like this. And, and since then, Barbados has been sort of struggling to kind of like manage and, and, and deal. So the question is, you know, do the responses to the unevenness, right? That is sort of produced through neoliberalism and further intensified by the global pandemic, do the responses, you know, um, problematize, you know, challenge the conversations around repair. And, and, and that's, you know, and, and that, that's a question, right? And, and, and that's a question that I think, 
many, many need to sit with um, because it, 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 I think it reifies, which I think the question implies that many involved in the struggle are themselves, you know, are, are themselves agents, right? Of, 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 of neoliberalism. So, yeah. Yeah, we are close to finish, but um, thank you for, um, for responding in this way. And I'm just asking this question about the question of disposability and you know, the cycle of it and who are responsible about you know, continuing <laughs> this legacy of, you know, in, in the 21st century. And the same happened in the Francophone Caribbean. Right. Um, and, and, and you can, and like the same happened in the Francophone Caribbean during the pandemic. There was this other, you know, things about where do you go during the pandemic and the island are open. <laughs> so I'm putting this question and who are we and what, how, how humanist means today in the question of reparation. Yeah, so in terms of responsibility, I just want to say this too. I think that, you know, who you can include in the list are the, the franchises, the sandals resorts, um, <laughs> okay, the people who, okay, the people who enforce children to sort of take the CXC exams, um, they, they, they too, right? They, they too have to hold the responsibility. Um, and I, I'm not entirely convinced that they are imagined at least enough as the perpetrators. So, yeah. but may I ask so, you a question? You. I mean, it's maybe the wrong uh, setting. A quick one. Yeah. Like you can. We will have maybe two minutes to wrap up and you know give the the mic to um, the student for the G the Balu High Union worker. So. Just go ahead and let's do it. I just wondered whether the reparation term is in a way problematic because the association is you repair something from the past. So it historicizes. It does as if it's a historical epoch where we talk about the continuities and legacies. So I think like, like we see with indigenous communities, a lot of turning away from recognition and reparation procedures because they say, you know, there's nothing to win within this frame. I mean, it's a kind of radical here, but I wonder what you two think about this, whether, and what would then be the other frame to operate in, which might be more successful? Yeah, and thank you for asking this question at the end, because you, you also put the question of transformation of the question of reparation and repair. So, yeah. Uh, we have to close up the question. Um, thank you for your presentation. They were amazing. The question was really uh, fruitful, insightful, very engaging. Uh, thank you for everyone today to be present here. And I'm going to give the mic to Howie to close this conversation. Howie, the mic is sent to you. Um, thanks, everyone, so much. I'm sorry that we had to cut you off at such a great time. Great question, Nicole. Um, we have Nina here from the union. Are you, can you turn on your video, Nina? Hi, how are you? <laughs> can you hear me? Yes. Hi, <laughs> hello <Yeah>. everyone. <laughs> um, basically, we just wanted to hear from you about the current situation um, of the graduate workers strike and um, just to get a bit more so that our participants get, can get a bit more detail about what's going on right now at Columbia and to awesome. at well, least thank intervene in some way to how <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you so much, Howie and Anna and um, Kay and everyone who, um, you know, invited me to speak. I'll try to be as brief as possible, um, but I do just want to let everybody know that the Graduate Workers of Columbia, GWC, um, UAW Local 2110 have been on strike since March 15th, so a little over a week now. And um, we have been bargaining our first contract for over two years. And we have been left with no choice but to go on strike because unfortunately the administration um, 
is just not seriously engaging our, our proposals, our very modest and reasonable proposals. Um, so just a little quick backstory. Um, I voted to join the GWC in 2017. 72% um, of teaching assistants and re research assistants voted to unionize in 2017. Um, we had to strike um, in 2018 for Columbia to even recognize that we had uh, won the right to unionize and we had to threaten to strike in order to even bring them to the bargaining table two and a half years ago. So we've been struggling to bargain our first contract for two years, but this is a much longer struggle that Columbia has um, fought us um, every step of the way. So just to kind of give a little picture of um, why we are on strike and, and um, the issues that Columbia won't move on. Two of the most significant issues are compensation. Um, you know, as with any union contract, uh, you know, at the heart of it is, is um, fair compensation for the labor that we do. Um, Columbia has offered us, <laughs> uh, it's going to be a three-year contract and Columbia has offered us a 2% raise for each year of, of the contract, which I'm sure um, even those of you who aren't economists can imagine that with inflation and union dues, um, that would actually be a pay cut for graduate student workers. Um, and you know, we simply cannot afford that during these, <laughs> these very precarious times. Um, and it's also just such a you know, diminishment of the labor, the value that we contribute to the university. Um, another issue that you might be hearing about um, like online or <laughs> in social media is we are very dedicated to um, winning um, third party arbitration for issues of sexual harassment and discrimination um, for uh, student workers. Um, so we, are, we want a contract that actually protects um, these cases being adjudicated, not by Columbia, not by people that Columbia chooses, but a neutral third party. And they have, they really are not willing to move on this. Um, they want to revise their internal system um, and they don't want it to be something that actually falls under something that our union um, would, ha would have, um, you know, control to negotiate over. So these are some of the biggest issues that we are really stuck on and the reason why we're still striking. So that's, I, I actually, if I could, maybe people have questions or um, if they want more information, I am, I'll just drop the link to um, our union website in the chat. And every here you'll find everything in terms of like signing up for, you know, we'd love to see you. We have a virtual picket line. We have an in-person picket line. We'd love for people to join us on both of those um, picket lines. Um, we have a hardship fund uh, because the university has said that they will be docking our pay and maybe even trying to take back some of our stipends that we get at the beginning of the sem semester. So, you know, just sort of amplifying the message of the strike um, and then participating in whatever way you can, you know, we, we would be very encouraged uh, by any support. But um, if anyone has any questions, I would love to just open it up for that as well. Yeah, if anyone has any questions, I think the Q&A is still open. It's so, so strange to like be talking to a bunch of blank yeah. bubbles, <laughs> but yeah. Thank you for sharing. I think this is an important matter that is in concern also your needs as a graduate student and, and understanding what it that takes for you in terms of your health and medical needs. So. Uh, we are supporting you here, the panelists, and I hope so uh, the audience to to this issue that is really relevant of you know what is you know capitalism in action <laughs> in everyday life, and not only um, you know there is concern. So uh, thank you for bringing this subject. Yeah. Yeah. Thank There's you. a question uh, from the audience um, uh, for you exactly. <laughs> uh, how many students does this strike? Uh, how many students does the strike and how many are involved in it? Sorry, how many students are, are striking and what? Involved and doing the strike, yeah, striking, how striking? So um, it's hard to get precise numbers because we have a virtual picket line and a 
in-person picket. And also, as you can imagine, people are all over the world right now. But from what I understand, it's, you know, anywhere from 700 not to 900 um, people, graduate student, GWC members are on strike right now. But I don't have specific, it's very hard to get specific numbers. And to be honest with you, um, I think that there's maybe some sensitivity around disclosing specific numbers, because I know that the administration would really like to know how many people are on strike. Um, so what I can say is that in terms of virtual pickets, I see hundreds of people showing up and then I'm not in New York, but um, there is a there is a physical picket happening at Columbia campus and I from what I understand there's been pretty big turnouts there as well. Thank you. Is there an older question from the audience? Yeah. Oh, there's another one. Okay. So this is the question I was going to question. <laughs> Great. So solidarity with the grad student at Columbia. Both grad students and faculty are at the University of Pittsburgh organizing. So Sorry, what's happening at University of Pittsburgh? Around. Hmm. There is a, a, an organization for you guys in solidarity what hap what, with what's happening uh, here at Columbia. So you are supported. Uh, That's so awesome to hear. Yeah, we have seen year. so much support and it's very, very encouraging. And especially just, yes, especially with the pay docking, you know, people are scared, obviously, of, of losing their income and just seeing how much people all over the country and the world support us is, it's very encouraging. Oh, we do have another question that you want to ask to Antonio. Oh, yeah, I just wanted to ask you um, if other, what's happening with other universities in the city, like, um, which, could you just give us a sense of the landscape of, like, which already have contracts? Like, oh, yeah, that's yeah. a great question. Yeah. So, um, and NYU um, has been, they are also, so our, like, um, parent union is the UAW. The UAW organizes a lot of graduate student workers all over the country. And NYU has, they bargained their first contract, I want to say like 10 years ago. And they're um, in contract negotiations right now. Um, so they are unionized. Um, they're bargaining their next contract now. Um, CUNY graduate students are in a union. Um, that's a little bit different because they're public sector workers. And in the US, you know, public sector and private sector workers are organized under uh, different sort of like um, legal bodies, um, but they are unionized. Um, what, other, what other schools are in New York? The new school, did you mention? That? Oh yes, the new school is also organized with the UAW and um, I think they won their first contract a few years ago. So um, this, yeah, we are the, from what I understand, we are the only um, graduate student union in New York that hasn't won our first, that out of the schools that are unionized that hasn't won our first contract yet. Um, so you know, it's time for Columbia yeah. to actually, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There is hope uh, because I, I think that, you know, with perseverance and persistence, I hope that you will, you know, sign a contract that, you know, value also who you are and, and the, your value, your worth to the university and your contribution. Yeah, because you are also the future of Columbia University. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And I wish you could tell them that because that's not how they're treating us at all at the bargaining table. Unfortunately, they're um, as 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 it is, you know, in other contexts, they they ask the people who have the least power and who are being compensated the least to sacrifice the most. Um, and that's what's happening right now. But I feel very, you know, I feel good about the strike I feel like we are reminding them how valuable we are <laughs> how much how essential we are to the university um, so I hope that that will change their minds any other questions or comments about the DWC thank, thank you um, yeah thank everybody everyone right 
Yeah, it was so great to to come join. I, it seemed like it was an awesome event. I'm sad that I <laughs> missed it and I only got the little tail end. But um, for those of you here who are GWC members, if you're graduate students at Columbia, um, I do just want to encourage you to come to our bargaining sessions. So we have open bargaining, which means that any GWC member can observe the bargaining. Um, we can't speak up, but only our bargaining team can can do the talking. But it's very, very informative to see how Columbia's team treats us, talks to us, you know, what they're willing to um, what they're willing to offer. It's very, very, very in informative. So um, if you are, a, let me actually, I'm going to put my email address in here. And um, if you want to come to bargaining, um, it's just through Zoom. Um, it's, it's very important. I think if you aren't already angry about what's happening, you, then being, yeah. witnessing what's happening in bargaining will really make you mad. <laughs> I've, I've heard it's um, a pretty depressing situation. <laughs> it's depressing, but yeah. <laughs> showing up in big number, like showing that a lot of GWC members are there watching and, you know, participating, it, it sends the signal to them, to Columbia, that we have power and, you know, you know, we're not just going to let them lowball us. <laughs> so I really want to encourage GWC members to come to bargaining. We have one, there's one tomorrow between 1.30 and 5. And um, of course, come to the virtual pickets, come to the in-person pickets. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm optimistic that we can win a, a contract that actually recognizes and respects our labor. Thank you for having me. And I hope you have a very robust discussion about whatever you were talking about before. <laughs> See you Thank later. You. Thank you. Bye. Okay, so thank you to attendees for being here. The next panel is on Monday and it's called Reparations Within and Beyond the Law. And it's with myself, Anna Shire, Yukiko Koga, and Olufemi Taiwa. Um, so panelists, if you want to hang on, um, we are going to keep chatting if anyone wants to keep chatting and just wait and see.